Bibles to the Gospel of Jonah, chapter 9. Excuse me, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. John chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by any other way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hears his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know his voice, the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we come before thee, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray, Father, for thy divine and supreme mercy, O Lord. Father, help us illumine our hearts that we may hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in your word, Father. May it turn, yield in us the fruit of repentance and faith. Help us, Lord, to be obedient, to hear your word, Father, and understand it. Father, we pray for your persecuted saints this morning. We ask for your divine providence and protection and that we in this side of the world remember them and use our freedoms to help them, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, to Him be power and majesty and dominion forever. Amen. Well, <clears throat> this morning we come back to this passage because it is important for us to understand the theological implications of this passage. The last time we passed through through this passage, we discussed the context. We talked about the implications and, and as to why did the Lord use this analogy. And we must bear in mind that if we're going to understand this passage correctly in its context, it is important that we view this passage in the light of what has taken place in the previous chapter. And that this analogy, instead of analyze it, instead of examine it in by its by its own, like we often tend to do, and just uh, concentrate in the theological implications of this. Instead of doing that, we must endeavor to understand why did the Lord why did the Lord use uh, this analogy. Now we see that the leaders of the people being represented in this analogy, they were represented by the reluctant doorkeeper and also the stranger. And we come to this conclusion uh, as we observe the context. Remember that we have this blind man who had come to faith who had come to believe and recognize the voice of the shepherd. So this analogy is provoked, if you will, by their willful rejection of the truth. You see, they try also to hinder, and in fact they were success, successful in turning the great majority away from Jesus. However, it is illustrated for our benefit that they were not always successful. Case in point, the blind man, the man who was born blind in chapter 9. You see, they tried to persuade him, 
They tried to persuade, they tried to discourage this man from following, from hearing the voice of Christ. But they were not able to do so. So this provokes a question from us. As we examine the text, this provokes a question. And the question is, why? Why were they not able to, to persuade, to discourage this man who had been born blind, who was healed, whose sight was restored by Christ? Why were they not able to discourage him, to persuade him? They, they told him, you follow this man and we do not know where he comes from. But we follow Moses. We know that Moses spoke, that God spoke to Moses. As to this fellow, we don't know where he comes from. We remember the dialogue to which the man responded, you don't know where this man comes from, meaning you don't know whether if he is from God or not, and yet he opened my eyes? Really? And we talked about this. But the question is why? Why were, were they not able to, to discourage him from following, from hearing the voice of Christ? Some people will say, well, obviously because he, he experienced a miracle. Some people will say that. But if we understand the purpose of this miracle, which is really called a sign, is not so much to convince the men, but to, to affirm, to affirm the veracity, the legitimacy, and the identity of the Messiah, Christ. Now in the beginning of chapter 9, we begin to see we are allowed, if we look back, we are given a glimpse as to the reason why they couldn't discourage the blind man from following Jesus. Even when he was threatened with excommunication. You see, when the disciples asked the question in the beginning of chapter 9, as to the cause of this man's blindness, we see that Jesus said to the disciples that the cause Yes, it's God. But they ask the question, Master, was it, was it, was it because of his own sin or the sin of his father, of of, of his fathers, of of his parents? That this man is born blind, and we are given a total different cause. You see, yes, Christ affirms that is God supreme, and the blindness of this man, of course, this was not in question. What was in question was the reason. The motive that God had to cause this man to be born blind. Now we see that that reason is the result of something that has nothing to do with any human action or intervention. But it has all to do with the divine purpose. Jesus said to his disciples that this man was born blind so that the Son of God can be glorified. So that in turn the Son can glorify the Father. This speaks about the divine purpose. And we must be honest. And that's why this morning we will deal with the subject of the divine purpose and divine election. And I know there are some people who are allergic to these topics. But the reality is that these are concepts that are found in Scripture explicitly and implicitly. And if we're going to be a good 
and faithful in temper of Scripture, we must deal and wrestle with all these implications in this passage. Now, a word of advice, and this is important for us to understand. You see, we must understand that if we're going to deal with the question of the divine purpose, we must understand that we mustn't try to understand this concept of the divine purpose. The concept of purpose, we mustn't understand it by the by looking at the, the question through the eye of human experience. That is, we mustn't insert human experience and our understanding of purpose with its limitations and impose them to God. And in other words, we mustn't try to conform God to what our experience as creature as creatures are in this world. But rather we must endeavor to understand God and this concept of purpose to which we refer as the divine purpose, we must understand, we must endeavor to understand it in the way that God has revealed it to us in His Word and in history. Let us go real quick to the prophet Isaiah. For example, Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 24, we see that the prophet, speaking on behalf of God, speaks about the firmness, the determination, and the power of God to carry his purpose. Listen to what it says. Verse 24, Isaiah 14, verse 24. It says, the Lord of hosts has sworn. He has promised. The prophet says, the Lord of hosts has promised. And he has done this promise. He has made this promise to himself. And he goes on and speaks about what this promise is. And it has to do with the divine purpose. So he says, as I have planned, so shall it be. And this is in regards of the purpose of God. So the first piece of information that we are given in this passage is that God has a purpose. And that He is intended, He is intent in bringing His purpose. Bringing His plan to pass. He continues and it says, As I have purposed, so shall it stand. So we see that this carries all the weight, all the power. This is backed up, if you will, by all the power of God. In simple words, this means that if God wants to do something, He will do it. Because He's God. That's the implication. And this is the conclusion to which, in a way of questions, does the prophet comes to in his writings. For example, speaking of what he will do they are the Assyrians to the people of God and the world. He says, I will bring the Assyrians in my land and on my mountains trample him on their food and his yoke shall depart from them and his burden from their shoulder. This is the purpose that I purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that it is stretched out. This is the hand that is stretched out 
over all the nations. You understand what he's saying? He is saying that the hand, meaning this is God's hand, has a purpose, and the purpose will come to pass because it is God who has purposed it, who has determined that it will pass. So he says in verse 27, and this is this is important. Listen to what it says. It says, For the Lord of hosts has purposed. And this is the reason why all these things will come to pass. Judgment upon the nations. Why? Because God has purpose. God has determined that this will come to pass. We don't have time to go into all the implications of this and the context in which this is said and what the Assyrians did and how the Assyrians served the purpose of God yet do and did what they wanted to do without God coercing them to act in evil ways nevertheless in doing so they were serving the divine purpose so we see that responsibility of the creature and the divine purpose in their intermingled but then there's two questions placed by the Spirit of God through the prophet. These are to do with our question this morning, with our, with our topic. He says in verse 27, For the Lord of hosts has purpose, and who will anoint it? No other translations say, who will thwart it? And no, in other words, who will stop it? If God has purpose, who is the creature that can stop the hand of God? That's the implication. That's the question. His hand, it says, is stretched, stretched out. God's hand has gone up to bring this purpose to pass. That is the implication. And it, and it asks the question, and who will turn it back? If the hand of God has stretched out to bring judgment, who can stop the hand of God? So with this in mind, then we must endeavor to understand the purpose of God. rather than try to interpret and to understand the divine purpose not based on scripture and what we have seen in history that God has done but rather through our experience so it is important that we if we're going to talk about the purpose of God that we stay away from inserting our experiences and our limitations and use them as the principle by which we will understand the purpose of God. In other words, simply what we are saying is that if God purposed something, there is nothing in creation, and that is that means everything, that can stop the hand of God. Now, we see that this blind man had been singled, he had been singled down, he has been singled out for two things. And we can see these two things in the text. Let us pay attention. Listen, this man has been singled out to be the means by which Christ will be glorified and the Father through the Son. That's the first thing. This man had been singled out to be the means by which Christ will be glorified and the Father will be glorified through the Son. That's the first thing. Number two, this man had been singled out. He had been separated. He had been predestined, to use that word, and we'll go 
to that word in the Bible because some people hear the word predestination and we are allergic to this and think that this word is inserted in the Bible, in our theology, but rather we must understand it that it is actually in the Bible. And it is implied here. Listen, the second purpose for which this man was singled out is to possess an unshakable faith. Even at the point of pressure when threatened with excommunication, this man had been selected, had been set apart to possess an unshakable faith. You see, he was one of those sheep who will hear the voice of the true shepherd and believe and when called by the strangers, he did not listen to them. See, this was a great reproach against the leaders of the people because they had tried to discourage him. And in fact, they were successful with his parents. Right? We remember in chapter 9, his parents were brought. They were brought in and they were questioned in regards as to the veracity of the blindness and the identity of this man. And the parents were afraid because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the people had already said, if anyone declares Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, they were going to be excommunicated. And you got to understand that to be excommunicated meant to be thrown away from the kingdom of God. <clears throat> but this man belongs to a selected group of people. We see them called in the New Testament, God's elect, God's chosen people, a people appointed to believe in Christ. His people are secured. Their salvation is secured. Listen, no matter what. Now, someone would say, well, that means that the elect can do and live however they want. But since they are chosen, they will be saved. Is that what it means? Because if, if they're elected, and if they are secured no matter what, well, that means that they can live however they want because they're elected they will not be lost is that is that what we are saying is that what we are uh, extracting from the text this morning well the answer the answer is no in fact saying that God's elect can live however they want and act however they want and sin however they want and they will remain saved because they are God's elected. Elect is a caricature. It's a blatant mis misrepresentation of what it means to be God's elected. Of what it means to be God's people. As we read this morning in Psalm 23, when we are presented the imagery of God being the shepherd of his people, we read that God leads his people to path of righteousness for his name's sake. Saying that God's people can behave and live however they want is a caricature. It's a misrepresentation mis mis of what really means to be God's elect. You see, if you are chosen, yes, you will believe. And yes, you will never lose your salvation. That is guaranteed. 
That's why phrases such as once saved, you always save were coined. But unfortunately, with time, the true meaning of what this means has been furnished, has been lost, and now is misunderstood, sadly. And there are great many who find themselves within the church, within the visible church, but yet remain lost because of a bad interpretation of what it means to be saved and being secured in Christ. You see, if you are if you are God's people, if you are part of God's elect, indeed, you cannot lose your salvation. But that is a contrast. There, there is a condition that we must understand. In, be uh, in between those two realities, that is, in between being chosen by God and possessing an unshakable faith, between them two, in between the security, the assurance of the, of the believer in God's election, there is uh, many things that we fail to consider as to the meaning of what it means, what it signifies to be God's elect. Things that, if you will, are part of the package. Things that come with that assurance. Things that are part of that salvation. Things that we are uh, given with salvation, with assurance. Things that are neglected by those who caricaturize what it means to be secured in Christ forever. These things are regeneration. That is, every person who is elected, every person who is chosen by God, is brought to faith by means of regeneration, by means of what Christ called the new birth, by means of what is called the new nature, a new creature by a change of the heart that is conducive to faith, that produces faith. By a change of the nature, by a change of the affections of our hearts. So every people who is chosen by God receives a change of heart and that change of hearts that change of heart con conducts us to faith and faith comes accompanied with fruit with a different nature faith is followed by sanctification and sanctification comprehends, sanctification comes, sanctification means correction, means discipline, strengthening, the strengthening of one's faith by the testing of that faith. Sanctification means correction, punishment, chastisement, on behalf of God for his elect and all this culminates in glorification that is when we are finally set free of this body of flesh this body which which, which is infested with sin so there is an ongo there is an ongoing process of sanctification on each one of God's elect once they come to true faith, which indeed all will do.
In fact, it is by means of this process of sanctification that, that the true believer is preserved. It is by means of this process of sanctification that the true believers are preserved. So if a person claims to be part of God's elect, part of his church, and yet lacks evidence that a process of sanctification is taking place in their lives, this is a great cause of concern as to the real state of our souls. You see, I believe that the real trust of this passage that the intention of the author is to provide a picture of the legitimacy of Christ as the one for whom the sheep were chosen. To him, those chosen from before the foundation of the world, to him they will listen and follow and will not follow anyone else. You see, that's why I believe that when we see these great deceivers, when we see these charlatans like Joel Austin, and how they have this great following, how they have these great buildings filled with people, I believe that these men are the judgment of God upon those who are seeking a false God and a false religion. You see, the Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Ephesian church, speaking as to the reason why God chose us, and the reason why God elected us, and the reason why we we were saved and are saved and are being saved and will be saved. Yes, the apostle says in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, he says, And you were dead. And he speaks of the condition in which we were found by God. He says, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the curse of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among which we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You see, the intention of the Apostle Paul in saying this thing is to show that what God did for the believers was something that was not caused by any human merit, but God acted in spite of our original condition. And that is why we find these wonderful words, perhaps one of the most wonderful statements in Scripture. In the light of this gloominess, in the light of this dark condition, this sad condition which humanity has found left to itself, the apostle says in verse 4, but God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, he says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, says the apostle. And raised us up, he says, with him. And seated us with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then he gives us the reason why he did this. Listen, in verse 7, he says, So, he says, that in the coming ages 
he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You see, all this is predicated upon the fact that God has done something that we do not deserve. With a purpose, listen, to display his grace. Just like the apostle says, so that in the coming ages, he says, he may show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And that's why in verse 8, he says, for it is because of grace you have been saved by the means of faith. And this is not of your own doing, he says, but it is the gift of God, not as a result of works performed, so that no one may boast. Now, you see, nevertheless, the apostle saying that it's not the result of works we've done. But, but there, is, there is works in this. What he's denying is that we were saved because of anything we've done. That's what he's denying. That's what he's denying. But he's also giving us a purpose. And he's telling us why and by what means. You see, he's telling us that we were work. Uh, I'm sorry, we were saved by by grace, not by works. But nevertheless, he speaks about works. Listen, he says in verse ten, "For we are his workmanship." Now, this is a very interesting word in the Greek. In the original language, uh, the the word uh, is used by Paul is the word poema. We derive the word poem from it, but what it really means it signifies the craft, the craft, the work of an artist, the work, the handiwork of an of an of a of a of an artist, the work of art of an artist. So what Paul is saying is that, yes, it wasn't because of our works. But what he's saying is that it was because of his works. And also he gives us a purpose. He says, created in Christ Jesus, listen, for good works. Right? So it is not because of our works. It is not because of anything we've done. But it is because of his works. But listen. Nevertheless. It is with a purpose. To produce works. So it is not by works. But unto works. Because of what he has done. And then, then, then he here it comes. What speaks to. To what we are seeing this morning. He says. Which God prepared beforehand. That we should walk in them. And then he speaks. To us for example. In the prior chapter. In chapter 1. He speaks of the fullness of time. And the purpose of God. Real quick. Go with me to first uh, to the first chapter of Ephesians. In chapter uh, 1. In verse 3. He blesses God. And then he tells us the reason why. He blesses God in Christ. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then he explains what he means. He says, Even as he chose us in him. Now, you see, he, here we begin to see the language of an election, of a choosing of a people. And the question is, when does election take place? Well, the answer is offered to us. In the text, it says, Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. 
now that we read that this election was made before the foundation of the world, that means that it was made before we had done anything good or bad. But somebody would say, well, God knew what you were going to do, and that's why he chose you. But that's not what we are told in the text, because we are told that this salvation, it is by God's grace, and by definition, grace means based on something we do not deserve. We are told that it is because of his purpose that we are saved. Not because he saw something that we were, we were, were going to do. That will imply that the reason why we're saved is because we, he saw that we were going to do the right thing. Henceforth, that would mean that he saved us in accordance to our works. Because under this context, faith becomes a work becomes the product of our righteousness, not the righteousness of Christ. We must understand that. So Paul says, in verse 5, he says, He predestined us. See? That word predestination. And we must understand, like the... Late Dr. Isis Pro once said in one of his lectures, every single system, every denomination in the Christian faith has a doctrine of election. The, the difference is found in the grounds by which this election is performed and our understanding thereof. But if we are honest with the text, we must understand that this word is found here. He says, he predestined us, meaning that God had a purpose beforehand, that's what it means, for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, According to what he saw that we will, we will do? No, it says, according to the purpose of his will. Remember Isaiah 14? Is that, there is that word. Again, the purpose of God. 14.24 The Lord has sworn, as I have purpose, so shall it be. And this is what Paul is saying. Now the question is why? Why did God do it like this? Well, the answer, we find it in verse 6. We may not like the answer, but nevertheless, this is the answer that God gives us in His Word as to why He did it the way He did it. As to why He elected in such a way, in such a fashion. As to why he elect some and not others. He says, To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And then Paul goes on into listing all the benefits we possess in Christ because of this great election. And the purpose thereof. Listen to what he says. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. According to the riches of his grace. Which he lavished upon us. In our wisdom and insight. Making known to us the mystery of his will. According to his purpose. Which he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time. To unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Paul is telling us that the reason he chose us is not because anything he saw we would do. But because he wanted to display, he says, the glories of his riches and mercy. 
Now the leaders of the people rejected Christ. They did not hear his voice. They did not hear the voice of the true shepherd of Israel. But there were and still are many who will hear his voice. We don't know who God's elect are. We can only recognize them by their fruit. But the question before us this morning is this. Are you one of those who can hear the voice of the shepherd? That's the question. Are you one of those who can hear the voice of the shepherd? Can you hear him calling? Can you hear the shepherd of your soul calling upon you today? Understand the text. God does what he wills. But in no way. That means that right now. There's no way. In no way that means that there is not before you this morning a legitimate call to believe and repent. Leave the mysteries of God to God. But what you must understand clear here is that before us this morning there is a legitimate call to repentance and faith. The question is, do we hear the voice? Do we hear his voice? Do we hear the voice of the shepherd? Do we hear him this morning? That is a question before us this morning. There are many who are led away, deceived, within the ranks of the visible church. And they're known because they're led away in heresies and all fanciful myths and tales and all kinds of wind of doctrines. But there are some who will actually hear his voice. The question is, do you hear him? Do you understand that this morning is placed before you? That means if you're hearing me this morning, if you're listening to my words in the authority of the word of God, I can tell you with all assurance that there is now placed before you a legitimate command, a legitimate call from the shepherd. Just like he did to this man, to this leader, so the people. To believe and repent. Ask the question. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord. Amen.